In this webcast, we'd like to use hybrid atomic orbitals to construct energy diagrams, molecular orbital energy diagrams. But in order to do that, we need to first know what the energies of hybrid atomic orbitals are, where they are placed at. So we're going to begin by looking at a, a typical second row atom in the periodic table that's going to have a 2s and 3 2p orbitals that will be involved in our valence bonding. For hybridization of those, we know that the resulting sp energy level is going to be a weighted average of the s and the p orbital from which it's derived. It's derived from one part s, one part p, and so our average is going to be exactly 50% of the way between the 2s and the 2p levels. There'll be p orbitals that are not involved in hybridization, and their energy remains unchanged. For sp2 hybridization, the weighting scheme is one part s, two parts p, and the result will be that the sp hybrid levels fall two-thirds of the way up from the 2s level. They're closer to the p level because they contain more p character. There's one level that's not involved in hybridization, and it remains unchanged. Finally, for sp3, our weighted average is one part s, three parts p, and so the new hybrid orbitals, four of them, are going to be three-quarters of the way up from the sp level. And so an important trend that results is that as we get more and more p character, the energy level rises. sp3 levels are higher in energy than sp levels. Let's use that now to construct the molecular orbital diagram of the acetylid anion shown here. The acetylid anion has a carbon-hydrogen sigma bond. That carbon atom is sp hybridized. It has a carbon that bears a formal negative charge, and that carbon also is sp hybridized. There's two electron pair domains for each of those carbons, so we know they're sp hybridized. All right, so let's add in the hydrogen level. The hydrogen brings with it the 1s level. Uh, in the middle of the diagram, we'll put the carbon. That carbon is going to have sp hybridization, and those sp hybrid levels are going to fall halfway in between the 2s and the 2p levels on carbon, and there'll be 2p orbitals that are not changed since they're not involved in hybridization. For the carb anion, it's also sp hybridized. It's going to have energy levels that are slightly higher. The reason is, is because when we have negative charge, formal negative charge, we know the energy levels of those original atomic orbitals are increased due to the negative charge, and so the new sp hybridization of the negatively charged carbon is 50% of the way between the 2s and the 2p levels of the negatively charged carbon. So let's construct our molecular orbitals. We know that the sigma bond between carbon and hydrogen is going to result from overlap of the 1s and the sp hybrid orbital. That'll create two new molecular orbitals from those two atomic orbitals, a bonding and an antibonding contribution. In between the two carbon atoms, one of the bonds is a sigma bond. It results from an sp hybridized atomic orbital on the neutral carbon and an sp hybridized atomic orbital on the carb anion. It also results in a sigma bonding and a sigma star anti-bonding contribution. Notice the sigma star energy is higher. It's been pushed up by the high level of the uh, negatively charged sp orbital uh, over here. There are four pi orbitals, two of them are bonding, two of them are anti-bonding. They result from interactions of the two p orbitals on the neutral carbon and the two p orbitals on the negatively charged carbon. There's one thing left and to describe, and that's the lone pair. Now the lone pair sits in a sp hybridized orbital, and that sp hybridized orbital is located on that negatively charged carbon. And so it's a non-bonding orbital, meaning it doesn't get involved in any molecular orbital type bonding. It doesn't therefore change its energy. It has the exact same energy value as the sp hybrid atomic orbital energy. Now we can add uh, some electrons. There's one electron coming from hydrogen. There's four electrons coming from the neutral carbon. And we'll put, for convenience, one electron in each of the hybrid orbitals and the p orbitals. There's five electrons associated with the carb anion. We have an additional electron here that is due to the negative charge. Now we can begin to fill in our molecular orbitals with those electrons. The sigma carbon-hydrogen bond gets a pair of electrons, one from the hydrogen and one from the sp 
hybridized carbon. Carbon sigma bond gets a, an electron from each of the sp hybrid orbitals that are shown there. There are electron pairs in each of the pi bonds. We've used all of the electrons now involved in hybridization or p orbitals. The one pair of electrons that we haven't yet used corresponds to the lone pair. And so that pair of electrons is exactly equivalent to that lone pair that uh, exists on the negatively charged anion. So there's one additional pair of electrons, a pair of electrons that came from that non-bonding sp hybridized uh, orbital. Let's put this into practice. Here's an exam problem from the spring of 04. I won't construct the complete orbital diagrams here, but what I mainly want to do is to try to use this diagram to understand why is the acetylid anion more stable than the vinyl anion. For the vinyl anion, we know that that carbon is sp2 hybridized, and so this sp2 hybrid non-bonding orbital will lie two-thirds of the way uh, between the 2s and the 2p levels that are negatively charged. There's the 2s level that's negatively charged, there's the 2p level that's negatively charged. Two-thirds of the way up is going to be the position and we know that it's occupied with a pair of electrons. Now, what about the case of the acetylid anion? That carb anion is sp hybridized, so it's going to be 50% of the way between there, and we can see that it lies lower in energy than the sp2 level. So there is a drop in energy. It's more stable, it's less basic, because those electrons are lower in energy than the corresponding sp2 hybridized orbital in the vinyl anion.